Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, again, I will present our work about finding and exploiting CPU features using MSR templating. So today I'm going to show you, first of all, a bit of motivation why this would make sense and why we need it in general. And overall, in this paper, we built a framework to even also classify MSRs and find their effects on instructions. And finally, I will convince you with a few case studies why this framework is actually usable and why the findings have security implica implications on modern systems. So let's start off with a bit of motivation. So what are actually these model-specific registers? So you can think of a model-specific register as an interface to the actual CPU's implementation, so like an API. And usually these registers are 64-bit wide, and they live, uh, they exist in a 32-bit address space. So you can imagine that there are quite a lot of configuration options on a modern CPU. Furthermore, usually they're documented in these uh, manuals. We know the Intel Volume 4 manual, which basically has these huge tables in there documenting the bits of the actual MSRs. However, due to the sheer size and some different constraints, some of these MSRs are usually not documented or only documentation is only available to specific vendors. So the general motivation of this paper was to find MSR bits and detect their influences on the micro architectural behavior of certain instructions. Furthermore, as we've seen due to recent micro architectural attacks or Spectre, Meltdown, and all these MDS sampling variants, we have seen that uh, microcode um, batches often add additional MSRs, which expose some configuration options to the operating system in order to give the operating system some way of configuring the actual mitigation. And finally, as we have seen in the past, there was um, previous work from Thomas, Thomas, uh, Thomas on its own, um, and basically found that there was an MSR which enabled a completely new instruction set on the certain CPU. So that's basically the motivation why we wanted to look deeper into this huge address space of these MSRs. So, um, <clears throat> so in the paper, we built this framework. So the framework is split into two main parts. We have on the left side, we have this detection mechanism. On, on the right side, we have this classification part. The main part of the framework itself is the MSR scanning part. We use basically these two instructions, which are on each CPU, to access these MSRs. So we have the read MSR instruction to read an MSR, and we have the write MSR instruction to write a specific MSR on that address. If we now combine these two um, instructions and the property that if uh, this operation is not permitted on a given MSR, we can basically scan the complete 32-bit address space and furthermore also detect which of these MSRs are read-writable or read and writable or simply not present. So. After the step, we have a complete list of all the MSRs available. And then we wanted to focus a bit more on this documented and undocumented aspect. So what we did there is we built an official document parser. So we used the official documentation available to the public domain and built a Python script that can basically extract these table structures we see in these PDFs. And after this step, we have further granularized the list of MSRs and split them into documented MSRs and undocumented MSRs. We then focused a lot more on these undocumented MSRs, and more precisely on so-called, we named them dynamic MSRs. So dynamic MSRs you can think of as an MSR, which exposes a sensor value. Think of a thermal reading, uh, energy reading, or something like that. So basically a time-continuous signal, which is changing. And since we know how to deal with time-continuous signals, we can use signal processing, like a correlation analysis, to find documented MSRs, which correlate with these signals. And that will basically give us an estimate or um, a hint to what the actual signal is exposing. For example, we can see that we found an MSR, which is high, highly correlating to monotonic counters. So our guess is that this MSR is also exposing a monotonic counter. So after this step of the framework, we have now a complete list for each undocumented dynamic MSRs, which some candidates which are highly correlating to, or some source hints of the actual signal. In the next phase of the framework, we then focused on the second group, which is remaining. These are the static, um, the static MSRs. So static MSRs are basically the opposite. They are unchanging. And there, the assumption we had was that static MSRs expose configuration bits. So since configuration bits are not fluctuating 
or not changing that often in a normal CPU. Um, these are usually, yeah, they're static. Okay, so, and now, as I mentioned in the beginning, the goal was to find the influences of these certain bits to a given instruction. So how can we do this? We basically execute the given instruction once without changing that bit in an MSR, and then we execute the instruction again with the flip bit in the MSR. And there we use a cool feature of modern CPUs, the so-called performance monitoring counters. So these performance monitoring counters are basically an interface to the microarchitectural world of the CPU. You can configure them and you can record certain events on the CPU. And then we simply make a difference between these two executions and see if we have a significant difference in the performance counter readings when flipping that specific bit, or more precisely, more, often more than one specific bit. If we don't analyze this BMC difference, we can simply report uh, this bit as influencing a certain instruction, and we can find these instructions. And for the final step of the framework, we then wanted to focus a bit more on the search space itself. And if you, you, you might know, the BIOS is one of the places where you have the most configuration options for your CPU. So here we had the idea that we wanted to extend the search space for the framework by simply changing a BIOS feature, uh, feature in the BIOS, um, which usually has more documentation. Um, as you think of um, BIOSes which have, which have feature-rich BIOSes, they usually have more options for a certain CPU than they are actually maybe documented in a manual. So the idea was to flip a BIOS um, feature and then trace the difference to specific MSRs and basically get an insight to what this BIOS feature actually uses in the background which MSRs is affected. And furthermore, we can also combine it with the remaining framework to actually see if it affects some instructions. So to just summarize the framework, which the framework is capable of, we can first search the complete address space and find each available MSR. We can find dynamic MSRs and their source hints or collating documented MSRs to get an insight on what this signal is actually, also which, which, um, what this MSR is actually exposing. And finally, for static MSRs, we can trace their configuration bits back to certain instructions. And for BIOS, we can track which MSRs are actually affected. Yeah. So after we built this framework, we wanted to motivate and um, show that it can actually find security vulnerable, um, um, sorry, it can actually find MSRs which has an, an effect on system security. We did it in six case studies, and we have both um, attack case studies and more defensive case studies. And interestingly, as we heard in the talk before, the prefetch uh, pref software prefetch instructions can actually be used for certain attacks. Here we focus more on AMB systems, so it does not directly correlate to the previous talk, but you can also think of uh, prefetch based attacks in some sense like um, in, in the regards of like a kernel address based layout randomization break. So on the left we see a uh, uh, virtual address space layout and the box is marking where the kernel resides in virtual address space. If we now use the prefetch side channel, we see a diamond difference where the kernel is actually located and we see a clear signal at the position 88. So we can now use the framework to search for configuration bits which influence the prefetch instruction. And on AMD systems, we found actually an MSR, which basically changed the load dispatch counter by exactly one. Interestingly, a prefetch should usually perform exactly one load, so we argued that these bits basically disable the prefetch instructions. We can then test the, prefetch, the case lab break from before, and we can see with disabled prefetch instructions, we no longer see a signal at the specific offset. So basically, we have mitigated prefetch software software-based prefetch case lab breaks on AMD systems. Overall, only 1% of um, binaries on a Debian installation use actual prefetch instructions. This is also reflected in the spec benchmark, so there is no real overhead. However, keep in mind that there might be some uh, applications which highly rely on prefetch instructions which are not reflected in that case study. For the next case study, we focused a lot on this ASNI instruction set. So the ASNI instruction set is basically the hardware implementation, a side channel resistant implementation of AES on modern hardware. More specifically, we focused on a lock bit. A lock bit is a bit which usually gets set after the configuration is finished by the BIOS, and then it prevents further modification of a specific feature. However, if we now move to a more advanced thread model, let's say the HGX thread model, we can basically flash 
uh, flush, flash, sorry, we flush, we flash this. <laughs> Too much prefetch in this talk, sorry. So we flush the BIOS and basically remove this protection, and then we gain a primitive. We gain the ability to disable ASNI, the ASNI instruction set, during the SGX execution exactly once. And now you might think, what can I do with that? But if you now take a look at the MBTLS library, which basically has a side channel resistant mutation of ASNI, which is usually often used in um, microcontrollers or low embedded systems, and we bring it to SGX, we can see exactly this pattern we're looking for. First, it tries to verify if ASNI is available, and if it's unavailable, and we basically use single stepping or some different um, way to basically interrupt an enclave at this point, we can then disable ASNI at this check and force the cryptographic library to fall back to T-table implementation. And as you all might know, T-table implementations have an effect on cache, and you can recover it. So we simulated a uh, uh, primary probe attack on the last level cache, since we're in the HGX thread model, and we can actually see the two different keys unexpectedly have two different cache access traces. We then showed in the paper that we can build a SAT solver and simply recover the full key based on this attack. Yeah. So for the next case study, we focused a bit more on mitigation of existing attacks. So there's this crosstalk attack. I can't go into much detail what it does or how it actually works, but it just as leaks random numbers generated on a CPU. So for this talk, we just focus on the unprivileged use case, and since, uh, yeah, for the unprivileged use case. And basically, we evaluated the leakage capabilities of crosstalk attack, and we can see that we need either the CPU instruction or RDC instruction to leak this randomly generated data. And we can see that the CPU instruction is way more effective in leaking the actual data. So we can leak 88% of the generated random bytes with the CPU instruction, but only 0.4% uh, of the bytes Generated, uh, generated by RDRunt when leaking with RDC. So we then use again our framework to basically search for configuration bits which influence the CPU ID instruction. And interestingly, we found one. We found a CPU ID, um, MSR bit which basically converted the CPU ID instruction to a trap instruction. This does mean that you can no longer execute CPU ID um, as you would pre um, usually, but instead it, or, um, it always faults when you execute it. We can then basically build a kernel, um, yeah, we can build a kernel module to basically catch these faults and emulate CPU ID on a system. What have we achieved, what, what can we achieve with that? We can basically remove the CPU ID primitive from this unprivileged attacker and harden the system against uh, the crosstalk attack by around the factor, by factor 200. Yeah. For, the, for the next case study, we then focused a lot on hypervisors. Due to the nature of a hypervisor, they have to closely interact with the hardware and basically emulate a lot of features for the guest, since the guest expects uh, classical hardware to run on. More interestingly, the Xen hypervisor implemented a so-called deny list for MSR accesses. Due to the nature of a deny list, undocumented MSRs are not present in the deny list, and the Xen hypervisor simply allowed read access to undocumented MSRs. So if you use RDMSR in the guest, First, the hypervisor checks if it's allowed, and if, if it's um, undocumented or unknown, it simply forwards it to the hardware and basically returns the actual value of, of the MSR. And if you remember closely, this MSR we're reading here is exactly the MSR which was highly correlating to these timing MSRs. So basically, we can enable a new timer in a, um, in a guest, even if the the hypervisor implements some sort of hardening against um, timing-based attacks. We can then use this timer to distinguish cache fields from cache misses again, and basically re-enable the four shield attack in such highly restricted environments. And finally, we can achieve a leakage rate of 200 bytes per sec approximately 200 bytes per second. And one of the most interesting case studies was that we can, similar to the instruction behavior analysis, we can also use the framework to basically diff microcode batches. So for instance, we install a microcode update, we monitor all the MSRs, and then we update the microcode and see which MSRs are newly added, and also which, MSR, which instructions were affected by these MSR bits. Why is this important? Because we have seen a few cases where these microcode updates are usually deployed months before the public disclosure, meaning that an adversary 
can get an advantage or a long time span to reverse engineer the actual effect of the mitigation. And that already brings me to the conclusion. So this framework is available um, on this GitHub link. Uh, I've we shown you a few case studies where we use this framework to show that there are actually MSRs which can affect sec um, security in a positive sense to build new defenses, and also this MSRs can open new attack vectors. And for more details and many more details on case studies, please read the paper. The QR code is actually working, so thank you, and I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'll start with a question from the uh, online, from an online question. Jan Jan Kars asks, uh, couldn't an MSR value change influence an instruction in a different way that is not visible in performance counters? Yes, totally. We can think of, we focused more on micro architectural effects, but you can also think of architectural effects like the rounding behavior of floating point instruction is actually, I think, configurable with some MSRs, and there you have an architectural change we won't detect in the micro architectural behavior. So this is, out, it was a bit out of scope for, for that. Thanks. Hey, uh, uh, great talk. Um, <laughs> interesting work. I just have like a, two small questions. Is one is, uh, did you notice when you were um, kind of playing with the MSR configurations if they affected the behavior of the PMCs and how you then use that to monitor uh, the effect on the instruction? Um, yeah, the best example is basically the prefetch instruction use case. I basically flipped one bit, and suddenly we saw a decrease in the load counter for the prefetch instructions. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah. so, so yeah, basically thanks. you first flip the bit, then you record, and then you diff, and suddenly you see a, a significant difference. So you usually have a few fluctuations there, which you can get rid of if you execute it multiple times. I actually was referring to the behavior of the PMC itself. So you use the MSRs oh. to configure their behavior. Yeah, yeah, and if actually, you notice that. Yeah. Yes, if you dig a bit in that, MS, uh, PMCs are actually configured via MSRs, uh -huh. so you have to exclude them because otherwise you're fussing your own monitoring yeah. framework. Yeah, That's and you didn't find any undocumented. Uh, uh, no, no. Okay, okay. and the second one is, um, did you think or do you think there's any opportunity to evaluate how like the MSR configuration registers might affect memory, like the layout of memory with respect, as opposed to just focusing on instructions? You know, so like in ARM style processors, there's configuration registers where it will basically invert the order, right, of how memory is, whether MSB, LSB. I uh, guess you could also, I'm not sure if it's ref reflected, as you said, in the PMCs, mm -hmm. but if it is, you would detect it also already here. But I guess there might be some extended, I'm, I'm, you might have to think about a benchmark where you can see a difference, and then just replace the performance counter with the difference detection, and it should basically work okay. similar Thanks. to that. Hi, uh, thanks for the work and the talk. Uh, there are like a lot of uh, MSR register and each one contains a lot of bits. Yeah. So how do you realistically uh, try to flip each bit and that's a look at question. all the register and all the counter that's, and that's, so on? That's basically a lot of focus on the paper is to optimize that. So uh, first of all, you can, for the search base, you can parallelize it with the course, it's a native idea. Uh, I would refer you to the paper for the more details, but basically we also used like an optimization approach. So we had like a limited bound for, there are also like enum fields for MSRs. Usually don't have single bits, you have like four bits defining something. And actually we said that these are independent of each other. Okay. And then you can just use 16 writes to MSR to test everything. And yeah, there are way more details in the paper, so. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And if I have time for one more question. Uh, so there are also a lot of undocumented uh, MSR. Uh, how much uh, MSR did you manage to classify and uh, with the <laughs> undocumented side? So I have Roughly. one additional slide for that. So that's actually the table in the paper. It's way too complex to describe, yeah. but we found around IMD has a lot of MSRs, which have, um, we have to, de um, the, the small caveat here is that most of the MSRs are just read and writable, but they ignore everything. So you can write to them. If you read it back, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, thing. Um, for the MSRs, which are more, uh, have a dynamic effect or similar effect, we described in the paper, but there was nothing interesting. So, the in so nothing interesting we could find. Yeah. There might be some more effects. It's a huge search base. We focus on the six, ca six case studies we could fit in the paper and in the time frame. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much. Let's uh, thank the... Uh,